absolutely enjoy this office space. It's beautiful, isn't it? If you can do a startup, you'll never see it. <laughs> yep. All right. Awesome. All right. So David asked me to talk about venture ready research. Uh, timely. I'm between gigs in a sense right now, so I'm actually doing this. I'm in the same boat you guys are, trying to figure out where I'm going to put my blood, sweat, and tears into next. And uh, every one of these has a kind of a different fingerprint, if you will, in terms of how you go about uh, doing research. Uh, to be very specific, I'll just be completely transparent. So if you guys want to steal one of those, one of these ideas, then it's a race, okay? So. Um, because I've got a part-time job at the University of Washington. They've got a bunch of technology and research over there. The idea is they're not doing a good job to commercialize it. So I'm over there hanging around trying to find somebody else's good idea that we can take and put into a company. Uh, one of them is Kazao. It's an online help system. allows you to layer contextual sensitive help right on the website. Instead of going to a help page, leaving the buying flow, and then, of course, that never solves any problems. You're ending up Googling your question, and then you find up in a forum somewhere, which is completely uncontrolled by the company, and all kinds of ideas on there, which might not even be accurate, but you've again now completely two levels away from the buying flow. And by the way, the greatest retailer on earth, if that's Amazon, that's exactly your experience. So they crowdsource your help, they layer it on top of your website, and they allow you to mouse over and see that it's available. You click, and boom, they can even add recommendations and parent-child relationships with uh, products, and it's a lower cost, raise money, right? But um, for that particular uh, business model, it's very easy because there's a lot of website tools and helps that make a website more effective and increase traffic and increase sales. So we have business models for that. Um, and so we have a market set of proxies, I can say. Well, it's just like all these web tools that help analyze traffic and help you understand how to make your website better from user experience. And so there's a set of business models I can just say, we're going to be like that. That's easy. If you got an idea like that and you can take it to a VC, you're almost done. You just list the proxies that were all successful and they say, yeah, that's reasonable. But if that doesn't work else, you have to go to some analogous models where they might have worked in another industry and you're going to say, well, I think it'll work here, right? And so if I take something like Cops for Hire, the idea that it's a dangerous world and we need to let off-duty policemen stand guard at our malls and our corporate office buildings and our schools and teach your kids to drive better and teach your Boy Scouts firearm safety and your block patrol how to maintain a safe block, um, those are all great ideas for off-duty policemen to go ahead and make extra money. Somebody needs to create a website to make that happen, right? Well, that site doesn't exist, but lots do, where you're matching people, and you've got to decide, am I taking their money and escrowing it, paying the cop when the job's done, or am I just facilitating some exchange like Craigslist? Okay, So you just have to find analogous models and say, all right, there's an analogous model, and this will really streamline the research, but sometimes those aren't available to you. So else, you have to extrapolate. So I've got this uh, deal we're working on called Michelangelo. It's a database idea where we're trying to facilitate a marketplace where you can go get customer lists and enhance them. Powerful database administrative tools that aren't available today to the average small business owner. I own a boat dealer in Issaquah, Washington. I might want to target my efforts to people that, I don't know, have bought a boat before or own a trailer, live on a lake have a vacation home in the San Juans. That's a little better than sending out mailers that I've got a boat dealership in your neighborhood and just wallpapering all the mailboxes. So uh, that, however, doesn't exist. How do people pay for that? And there's very few models over there. So I have to extrapolate from something like Constant Contact or some other application that's already kind of, you know, assessing or addressing the same need. And I extrapolate that model over and I, I build the investor's belief that yeah, it's a reasonable leap, that if people will pay for something like this, you can extrapolate it to this one, right? What if that's not available? Well, then maybe you just kind of say, well, it's in the cloud, and hope for the best. Um, that seems to be a pretty popular thing now to do. And you'll actually get away with it with some of the VCs that are just you know hungry to invest in something that says that they've got a cloud investment. But that probably won't work. Uh, and uh, if you can't find something like that, you're kind of out of luck, um, and you're on your own. It becomes very difficult. So we'll get into maybe how you can overcome that. 
Uh, Flowboard is a uh, really cool one of the best things I've seen in a long time. It's a Seattle company. They've been languishing for years building mobile apps. And they now have a way to create really cool uh, storytelling on an iPad or a tablet. So you can author rich storytelling. Import links, import video, import text, graphically laid out very quickly. Um, and it's, a, it's not just a presentation software, it's really about rich storytelling. And I think it's going to be a very popular thing, but uh, there's not a single app that's made enough money to get VC's attention on funding something like that. So when he goes around and says, this is a great product, everybody agrees. Now tell me the proxy for who's made $100 million with a mobile app. And after angry birds, you're going to be a little dumbfounded because there's nothing out there. So then you go to analogous models and there aren't any and so it's a great product searching so I put that one in the bottom because it's really right now kind of uh, struggling to find confidence in its business model um, and it's all about we can't find the research that supports a, a model so with that um, a couple of things I need to address up front um, been at this a long time love doing this um, seeing I'll never say I've seen everything because I know tomorrow I'll see something uh, but I've been through all this, and there are definitely um, three big lies that I will warn you against. And you will believe them sincerely. And I know you've already said them, and I know you'll say them, because I'll say them again, but they are lies, and here they are. First one is our projections are conservative. Everybody says it. You really believe it. They're not. <laughs> Things happen. They just always happen. Some of them are out of your control, but they happen. My biggest competitor is time. Time is the only thing that I allow to beat me. Time is people changing jobs. But time is just delay. Time is just things happen in my life that defocus me. Time is my only, enter, my only enemy, but it just they never happen. So it's not about you won't make it. It's about adding a year. It's about adding six months. So you think you can accomplish things in a certain amount of time, and that's the way you're, you're wired, and you should be. And so I'm not saying... You know, don't think that way because that's the only way things get done. Be aggressive. Believe that you can happen. You can make things happen quicker, but don't put them in a model <laughs> and and set that as your expectation to investors. Second one is, um, and this doesn't matter if it's Gartner, IDC, GigaOM, Forrester. Pick your name. It says our market will be 65 billion by 2012. I, by the way, did this thing in 2010. So there's some interesting anecdotes that um, will come out of this. Uh, the trouble with that is that by the time they're really clear on that, it's already happened. The, the, the research guys aren't predicting the future. Go back and look. Um, it happens, and then they're talking about it, but uh, sometimes you sit in a very, very, very crowded market by the time the research guys have all jumped on board and are making uh, selling conference tickets to learn about it. That's the time when it's already crowded because people like you are meeting in every entrepreneurial city in the country trying to figure out how to find the next opportunity. And then finally, um, all we have to do is get 1% of the market. And there's two problems with that. Getting 1% of the market, getting initial traction is hard. If you, uh, I'll guarantee you, getting your first 1% is harder than getting to 10% after you've got the 1%. It's hard getting from zero inertia to something meaningful. It might not be big enough or interesting, and it is hard. So uh, when you say something like that, you have to understand how really hard it is to get above all the noise of all the things that are going on. So uh, just keep in the market in the mind that when you're pitching your research and you come up with these kind of statements, they are so jaded in hearing this. So you have to go to extra lengths to support your uh, assumptions to support your timing and to support your milestones. That's all. All right, so um, yeah, I don't think this is really a necessary slide. Things are going faster. I mean, this was actually kind of a novel thing to say three years ago, but now we're so used to it. iPads are 120 million themselves in two years. So I think Android beats that just because they have so many different devices. But you can see the flattening of how long it takes to get to a 150 million devices and make a meaningful market. But this is true of mobile commerce. This is true of health, even healthcare now. In fact, the, the pace of innovation and introduction and new companies and new ideas. The message here is you guys have to be really comfortable making decisions with less information than you'd like to have. 
and do that on a continual basis. I have a little rule that says if it's a seven or better, we go. And the key is execute at 10. But you'll never get to a decision that feels like a 10. There's always a little more information. There's always another thing to consider. So if you think it's out of 10, at least a seven, go. All right, so start off with, you know, what do we research? What is it that we have to go research? And, and your, your initial thoughts are, well, the, the market size, the market opportunity. Well, that's a small part of the research you gotta do. I'm only gonna address the ones in red. David's actually gonna address some of these other ones in terms of market entry strategy and sharp market entry point, those kind of things. But those have to be researched as well. And I meet guys that have been in this business for a long time that still stumble over some of these, these small things. Big market opportunity, it, I know it's there, but the nuance of your strategy, have you researched that and found the right business model, the right pricing model, the right first vertical market to go in, all those things. So we're gonna jump into one, three, seven, and eight here. So uh, I just like the character. <laughs> but, um, when I started in this business, I was sent to every, oh, Hewlett Packard, my first corporate job out of college, they sent me to every training in the world because they had the money to and they didn't have a formalized training program. So they just figured, okay, well, let's pay them to go to every kind of sales training you could ever imagine. And we had to kind of figure out which ones really mattered and which ones complemented each other. And, you know, this is the way to sell. No, it's really this way. And it was just very confusing. And I think you can get the same way with, with strategy frameworks. Pick one. doesn't matter. Chasm's great. SWAT's great. Blue Ocean Strategy, great. Pick one and focus on a single framework and a single discipline to work through your analysis, okay? If you get caught up in too many different types of problems, um, of problem frameworks, and you're trying to bounce back between them, you're gonna get a little um, off path uh, and confused. So just pick one that you're very comfortable because all these lead to very disciplined, methodical processes that have trustable conclusions, okay? So I wouldn't worry about, you know, if you think a certain way, use that, but just pick one. So if you look at Blue Ocean, um, these are real examples. This is a company I founded a long time ago. It still exists. Um, it's realtor listings on the internet, and they help you find and buy houses, but really it's just a method of selling you stuff around the time you buy a house. Because we know you spend 10% of your house between 30 days before you buy it and 60 days after you buy it. New fences, drapes, new carpet, get the place painted, whatever. Uh, what we did there is um, we created um, a direct-to-consumer strategy. Uh, the realtor controlled everything. They still do largely. We're still trying to break the impenetrable control of the realtor of your entire buying process. Redfin's trying to take another angle at it. Um, this was the first attempt to put some power in the consumer's hands. The old days you got in a car, you watched, you, know, you looked at four properties, and you knew the fourth one was going to be the one they wanted you to buy because they throw you three dogs at the same price, and then you go, oh, this is, this is the same price, and you were hooked. And, and it was just a terrible process. So putting all the listings and a lot of rich information about them and on the Internet and directly empowering the consumers, just like going into a car dealer with the invoice in your hand and understanding exactly what they paid, and now the whole process is different, right? So kind of that. So... They were really trying to create realtor access to listings, platform services, and um, change this model. So um, understanding in the Blue Ocean strategy what you're trying to do, it'll also help you figure out how that systemically solves your business model problem, your pricing model problem, your where your entry point, all that. If you look at Redfin, um, very similar things, but you're also now um, more to the consumer because now they actually list the house. So instead of just empowering with information, now they are the sales agent, essentially. It's a FISBO kind of thing. Um, even richer information now is available to allow something like Redfin to happen. So examples of trying to think about your business, what are you changing? If you're, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Blue Ocean Strategy. I'm not going to go through it today. If that's something you're interested in, um, great book. Um, and it's, a, it's taught in a lot of business schools right now. Um, might be the most recent thing people look at, but um, it, it definitely defines certain disruptive kind of models that have happened over the few years. But there's, like I say, if you do a standard SWOT analysis, I think I have that here. Um, still use this all the time. Uh, a lot of people think um, this way about their business, and this is um, going to have advantages. 
So this is um, really measuring internal and external. And that's really important to, to distinguish between what you can't control. There's certain things you can't control. They, they represent risks to your business, the economy. Whether we're at war with four or five different countries at any one point in time could change a lot of things that have something to do with your business. I had a, um, I uh, was on the board of a company called Bond Hub, and uh, somebody, this is a great idea for somebody if you want to steal this. Uh, somebody's going to make a lot of money doing this. Uh, we talk about the equities market. It's a very um, interesting market. That's Schwab and E-Trade and all these things where you can trade stocks. The bond market is 16 times bigger than the equity market. It's massive. There's not one single place you can go and find all the bond listings. Why? Corporates, corporations create custom bonds that they want to offer for specific reasons. How do they publish them and get them to all the bond buyers? Likewise, bond buyers don't know where to find all the corporate bonds. So it's an obvious disintermediation exchange opportunity and the, the massive size of it. So there's a company, real sharp guys from Microsoft, started a company called Bond Hub. And they got it off the ground, they got initial angel money, and they actually started trading by phone before they even had the website, right? And started aggregating all the bond issuers and aggregating all the bond buyers. And they were making great momentum, and their biggest customer, the largest bond trader in the world, was McCann Fitzgerald, which is the top two floors of the United Nations building. And when I say you lose a customer who's using their system, they put on black suits and went to funerals. I mean, that was it. it just, the company died right there. You can't control that. They didn't do anything wrong. Not that you could have researched that, but um, there are external threats that you have to be aware of so that you can scale your business, scale your fundraising, scale the time of market entry. Um, and a lot of them are macroeconomic things you can't really control. A lot of them are you know, um, maybe uh, access to um, products or services or components that you're dependent on where the supply chain is uh, interrupted in some manner. So anyway, it's a good way to understand what you can control and what you can go affect and then be cognizant of what you can. I think that's one of its, its uh, you have to be honest about your strengths. You have to be honest about your weaknesses. And this model doesn't work if you're not, by the way, because uh, your weaknesses, if you don't fix them, will kill you. Uh, this is a chasm group, different way. I actually love this one. I had the co-author of this book on my board because I had such a problem figuring out how to position and point my company once by the way, we never solved it, <laughs> even with him. Uh, my very first startup called Two Way Corporation, uh, and we sold the product. It was flying off the shelf the first year. Uh, the trouble is the first eight customers that bought it used it for nine different things. That sounds pretty compelling, and if you're an inexperienced CEO and you don't realize that you're not building something that solves a problem, you're building some Swiss Army knife that have nine pioneers buy and do something different with, We there was not the we couldn't cross the chasm. I mean, classically, we could not cross the chasm. We sold it to a bunch of early pioneers. And that was fun and exciting, but it never hit the mainstream. And we never solved it. So the idea here is that you pick a vertical market entry point, and he's going to talk more about this, that you can win. Not the biggest one, not the most exciting one necessarily, not the one that's got the largest upside value, the one you can win and declare victory. Plant a flag and say, we are the leader here. Then you go to the next one, that is adjacent to the one you just won. So it's either the same application in a different market segment, or it's a different application in the same market segment. Okay. So if you look how Amazon's a classic deal. I interviewed with uh, Jeff when he was starting uh, Amazon. He goes, well, we're going to sell books, but next is videos. And we got to win books, and then we're going to go to videos. I mean, this was his classic strategy. Now, you know, you look at Microsoft, and they a little different, but they stayed very close to their knitting in desktop OS, and then they created applications very closely linked to the OS, so much that they got in trouble with the, right, the <laughs> unfair competition <coughs> police. Uh, and, you know, here we are 20, 30 years later, and whoops, we're making Kindles. But they didn't go from books to Kindles. It took them a long time, because they stepped through adjacently and kept their strategy very compact and tight so that they were never making an extra leap beyond the segment they were in or into an application that didn't fit into their current segment. If you look at Microsoft, they're in Barney Dolls and Xboxes. Yes? What if it had a change in the web search? What's that? What do you think of their change? You know, that fails more often than it succeeds. Um, that's not new. 
by the way, cloud's not new. I'm old, been in this a long time. Uh, I had my first computer sales job in 1983. That meant that the world was called IBM. Everything else was just a squirrel looking for a nut. They had things called timeshare, and they had their data centers, and you had a terminal. And the cloud's different, I get it. The cloud's more powerful, but it's the same concept. We've just, you know, it's like fashion. It's swung the pendulum around. And um, so Boeing Company, which uh, bought a lot of IBM gear and used it to do large-scale CAD CAM and uh, simulation and, you know, every possible big computing solution or application, so they decided, hey, we have all this capacity. Let's timeshare it to other people. So they started an entire division called Boeing Computer Services. And you could go to Boeing Computer Services if you were Honeywell or Hewlett Packard or, you know, some research group. I think Battelle used them. And, you know, University of Washington probably bought some timeshare with them. And that wasn't their core business. And so um, ultimately it failed. Um, I'm very surprised that um, Amazon did so well. I think, you know, if I had to put a quick stamp on it, huge need, huge vacuum. They're the only guy thought of it and, and got in there. Um, how it turns out over time, we'll see. You know, we, we have lots of problems with AWS right now. Our games go down. They're not 5.9. They don't, they don't give you an SLA. I don't know if you guys have ever deployed anything on AWS, but, you know, in the old days, it was like, all right, what's your SLA? Your service level agreement. And um, we had terms like in carrier grade or 5.9 or 4. There's no nines in their uptime, guys. Um, ask Zappos. Ask Netflix, who go down over holidays and key selling times. So I, I don't know. We'll see. But uh, obviously the race is on with Azure and Google, and uh, there's a new company, VMware. Not new, but a new strategy. VMware is going to try and usurp that. SAP is trying to build that. We'll see what happens. I don't know. But um, certainly they have competency there, without question. So it doesn't violate this principle at all in that case. Um, especially given they're, they're into lots of things, but they have absolute core competency in deploying large scale, big data, right, um, solutions and applications. All right, so we, we, we go from uh, now some more little practical stuff. Um, you guys know these terms, I'm sure, the total available market, addressable market to you, and then the, the, the real important, uh, what I can address with my first product. There's a big difference, and you got to make sure you catch those leaps, right? Your first product, if you believe in you know lean, agile startups and minimum viable product, is you're going to put a product out that solves a problem. It might not be the full implement of your dream or vision for where you want to go. Probably shouldn't be. You need to get to market, validate something. Um, but your first addressable segment is something that you can solve 100% for. So if you built a product that's 80% of a solution for something, you're going to be disappointed when it hits the market. You might as well miss it by 80%. Missing it by 10%, might as well miss it by 90%. So you've got to be a complete solution for whatever your first addressable market is. And you don't have to build more than that. Get that, build on that momentum, and go from there. And that's really what minimum viable product, agile startups, lean startup, that's what that's... That, means. Now, don't apply that to everything. Let's take video games. So, latest company, Z2 Live, which I was starting when I first did this. If we put a game out, let's take our game Metal Storm, which is a dogfight air combat game. And um, if we put that out with two wireframe planes and a couple joystick buttons at the bottom and said, you know, minimum viable product, you like this. The gamer audience hits the lame button gives us one star and less if they could, and rips us a new one in the forums and the ratings, and we die, and we're dead, and it's over, okay? So minimum viable product, you have to be real careful about that. In the gaming business, it's graphics that kick ass. <laughs> it's a UI that's wow. Now, I don't necessarily need to put into the game the ability to upgrade your plane, or to own multiple planes, or uh, to have some... Uh, ability to create custom weaponry. That doesn't need to be in version one of the game. But as far as a dogfight experience between two planes that are battling over some landscape, it has got to look awesome. That's a minimum viable product. So just remember, in some cases, minimum viable product might still be full on awesome for a limited kind of functionality. So anyway, 
you got to figure that out, and you got to figure that that first target market where you can go win it quickly, declare victory, and then start marching to the other. You know, the idea is that the first pin knocks more easily the next pin down, and you start to build momentum. And it's a really very, very, very valid valid uh, market strategy. Okay, so kind of some core. Finally, we get to some core market research. This happens all the time. So you don't need to see this, by the way. These are um, usage charts by country on. Um, Smartphone OS usage, which is tantamount to can they play a game? Can they play my game? So th this was actually my research I was doing in 2010 when I gave this this talk. So you look at all these charts, and VCs love this. They're like, well, you know, Spain they play a lot of games. You know, they have a lot of, they have a lot of smartphones. Uh, yes, true. Uh, UK they seem to be you know smartphone heavy too. They're already at 40 percent or whatever the numbers. But the, you take some discipline and keep asking the next question until you're kind of exhausted. Couldn't be more important. So you look at that closer and you say, all right, but where is worldwide social gaming? Um, by the way, it's not even in North America. It's Asia. Okay. How many people really realize that? There, um, I went to Shanghai and Beijing and uh, Shenzhen in October, and I met with eight companies that were over a billion dollars in revenue that I'd never heard of before I booked the trip. And I was just very humbled. It's hard. You, you name a billion dollar gaming company. There's EA, there's Activision, Zynga. I met with eight. <laughs> I'd never even heard of them. Now, I, you know, most of you probably have heard of a company called Tencent, right? Maybe not. I don't know. They're bigger than Facebook, by the way. Does anybody know that? They're a bigger social network than Facebook? by a significant amount. They're also bigger than PayPal, bigger than eBay, bigger than Twitter. All those things are true, I just said. They have the largest picture messaging application in the world. It's probably something I'm forgetting. <laughs> There's 64 billion. You can stack EA, Activision, anybody else you want to name all night on top of each other and you won't get to their market cap. A little company in Shenzhen, China. It's only like six years old. You're building a gaming company, and Asia isn't laced all through your strategy. You're missing the entire big opportunity. But a lot of people think very provincially, and they think America must be the biggest market. Everybody comes here to do business. There's, there's a shift in a new sheriff in town, guys, uh, with respect to gaming anyway, and many other markets. So if you don't have, if you're building games, for instance, that aren't going to play well in China, you're really limiting your company's ability to grow. Our first game was uh, number one in China in 48 hours. And it made a difference. <laughs> um, then there's the next question. All right, we know about smartphones, but I wasn't specific about Android and iOS. I can't tell you how many companies made this mistake. I would say 70, 80% of all gaming companies made this critical mistake by not asking this question, assuming that Android and iOS were equally important decisions to make 2010. 2011. Z2 Live still has not shipped an Android game. And I'll guarantee you we have not suffered one dollar of loss for doing so. Android, it turns out, and by the way, this number now is over uh, 64. These are versions of the Android operating system. So every platform has this unique operating system, which means I have to build a different version of the game for every version of the operating system. Okay? To address all of these, and ones that have come out since this, this only goes to 3GS, so now there's the 4, the 4S, the 4, iPad 3, 4, one binary, one product. So the economics of addressing this versus this are wildly different. So the correct business decision is, I don't care about Android right now. There's other issues, too, in terms of how well it monetizes when you keep asking the next question. So we were one of the few companies that said, we're not doing Android, we're not doing it. We had boards banging, our board was banging on the board table saying, you're missing the opportunity, because they kept reading, Android's outselling iOS. Right now, Android is outselling iOS two and a half to three to one. Three to one in Asia, two and a half to one in the US. And you can still make more money on iOS. If you keep asking the next question, what it costs to address that platform, what you can make on that platform, stick to your research, stick to your decision process, and say, we're going to stay on iOS until the opportunity cost of doing so is too high, and I've got to switch over. And we have 
the company has enough money in the bank to fund that effort as soon as we want to and as quick as we want to. Um, this is just a rehash of the, the thing I made. <laughs> there's, there's actual and there's forecast. Um, and um, this goes back to really um, being a little cynical, uh, whatever, about forecasts um, and don't bake them into dependency in your business model. These guys make money selling research, getting you to go to conferences, buying white papers, buying research notes, and they're not bad people, they're good people, and they're trying to help. So read them, but have a little discretion about when these things actually really happen. I've been in mobile since 19, what's the first, 92, I think, when I uh, started with Motorola. We've been talking about mobile data since a long time. <laughs> We've been talking about interactive TV since the 80s. And we talk about it in terms of it's next year or two years away. Um, this is mobile network traffic. This is an actual forecast. And this is an actual actual. And they're several years apart. What you probably can't see is one is uh, middle of 2008, and the other one's the middle of 2012. That's four years apart when that actually happened. Just one example, but a lot of companies build products, build factories, build divisions, build business units on this kind of data. So uh, just be wary. Um, I'm not sure how this fit. I can't remember the flow. This is two years ago. I honestly can't remember this. But um, this perplexes me. So uh, people get together and they say, right, what are the top 10 human needs in the world going forward? And so you say, well, I'm going to build a company around energy or going to go stamp out poverty. We certainly need security. It's a dangerous world. All those things really matter. Um, and then you look around at the business successes, and you find a few things that are curiously missing, like sneakers that have blinkers, or Crocs. Uh, at least they have their day of fame. Or, you know, Lady Gaga. I don't know. Um, look at your business uh, from two constructs. One is... Um, there's a real need. But don't be disillusioned if you can't make that top list over there and <laughs> justify your business. Because uh, all you need for a great business is a customer. And there's plenty of customers for all kinds of products, even sneakers and blinkers and bigger TV screens. Uh, they're, they're not needs, but if you're playing on an emotional. So I, I guess I, I, know, I remember the thing now, actually. This is about video games. We don't need mobile video games. Mobile video games would probably be one of the best places you could build a business in the last three years. I, you know, I don't know, unless you got a cure for some cancer or some nano thing that I don't know about. Video games, mobile content is about the fastest growing, biggest, most lucrative place to be. And that's where we put our money. But it doesn't show up on the top left. And that actually, you just got to, you know, be at peace with that. I'm not sure I ever was. Very strange. Um, so this is the part of research that um, seems more natural, um, asking actual potential customers. I don't trust focus groups. I don't believe in focus groups. I've seen them a million times. We used um, every focus group methodology at, at Motorola you could possibly imagine. And people don't intend to lie. If you're Nielsen, before you had set-top boxes that really plugged into people's living rooms and asked them what they were watching, you know what they told you? McNeil Lair. Everybody's watching McNeil Lair. Nobody's watching Jerry Springer. But when you plug in and actually figure out what they're really watching, Judge Judy becomes the category winner in the daytime afternoon. Period. I got a friend who builds those shows, The Kardashians, Project Runway, Bad Girls. These are Bad Girls Club or whatever. These are horrible shows, but you know what? People watch them, but they will tell you that they're watching wholesome PBS, movie of the week, some intellectual drama, right? West Wing gets canceled because it's just too much energy to understand. <coughs> you don't think that was well written, but I did. Uh, so get into their minds, but try and work through them telling you what they want you to think about them. When you say, will you pay for this, it's very easy for somebody to say, yeah, I'd pay for that. I love it. Okay. Will they actually pay? That's a completely different thing. So. Um, when you ask a, the next question, well, will you buy again? Why will you buy? And you get more context, and you'll build more confidence around those answers. 
So asking somebody, is this valuable? Would you pay? How much would you pay? That's one thing. Now ask them why. Ask them to regurgitate why they would pay and why they would buy again. And why would they pay more? What would you have to do to the product to make it more valuable? And then you get more confidence in the original tree answers, right? Uh, this little texty, I, I don't know if you guys can all read this, but um, I'll, I'll read them to you, I guess, because they're quite far away. Uh, the first one is uh, obviously competitive companies. Um, that's pretty obvious. Um, but then there's the people using related technologies that could enter the space. So um, a lot of people have the construct that big companies can move in when small companies prove the new space, prove a new solution, but these big companies have resources. This is, the, this is the notion that, oh, Google will just wipe you out if you try that. By the way, it's hardly ever true. I mean, it does happen, but more often than not, they don't move very quickly. They miss things right under their nose, and they're the best people to compete against. I mean, look what Microsoft has missed. It's, it's not laughable because the Microsofts before them, the IBMs or everybody else, missed them too. So um, companies with using related technology, you need to know about them. You need to be informed. When you go in front of a venture capital or a funder, the fact that you do, aren't aware of their ability to move into that space is, a, is a, um, a negative on your total grasp of the competitive landscape. Um, people in your segment that are targeting your same customer, but they have different solutions right now for them. So they could literally just say, well, we can add that to our solution mix. Uh, companies, uh, other so this is a great one, especially now, in my world, um, people in the U.S. now fear Asian game companies. Uh, in China, Japan, and Korea, some of the greatest game companies in the world, as I've said, and they know how to build compelling visual experiences, and they know how to use and, and leverage these mobile devices. And so uh, a lot of people just forget the fact that there's other players now that have um, powerful competitive advantages and can move in. So uh, it's a new, more dangerous world. It's not just about what new company from America is going to dominate the world, right? Um, there's companies like Angry Birds from Finland, six guys in Helsinki that created a phenomena that uh, we all benefited from. They've raised the entire visibility of the whole game segment. So they haven't hurt us per se, but. You know, they kicked our butt. Um, and there, there's plenty of people from other geographies that can come in and make sure you understand that. And then finally, um, and this is actually pretty easy now because of all the tools. You can go to TechCrunch and see who else has gotten funded recently and you're just trying to do something similar. What um, has been uh, backed by ventures and is, is started now in, in your space and having a, a full understanding of what they're all doing. Uh, and the point of that is just, you, know, you just can't be blind on the competitive stuff. It'll um, trip you up while you're trying to raise money if you're not knowledgeable about it. And um, the second point is even better. You can learn from them. And the trick is, uh, I never see them as anything that is fatal about me going forward. It's like, okay, I'm going to learn faster than they are. And that's um, really the best thing you can offer um, as a competitive weapon is just learn faster than everybody else in the space. So I listed all the guys that worried me back then in 2010. I didn't touch this slide. so. Um, Big Fish uh, really hasn't gone anywhere. Zynga has gone public, and you know you can argue about their success or failure, but it's a multi-billion-dollar deal. Um, all these guys, some of these guys still aren't even aren't even still in the game. EA and Activ Activision is hardly even in the mobile space at all. So we we wound up actually doing business with Activision. So sometimes they wind up being partners and cooperative. In our case, they were guys that funded our first game. We built something for them. We took their cash. We took the cash, we built our first game, and that made us profitable. So it was a very valuable thing. And of course, Apple's our biggest partner. Um, oh, this is a great, 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 I forgot about this. Um, your first customer is your first investor. People uh, often confuse in uh, raising money with other forms of selling. Raising money is selling. So the first person I had to sell my startup to was my wife. If I'm going to spend that much time and energy, I've got to convince her it's worth my time, sweat, blood, tears, her support, patience, understanding, tolerance. That's a big sale. 
Otherwise, the startup's the enemy of our relationship, and that's a terrible dynamic. So they, they really have to be on board. Um, then you start hiring employees. Oftentimes, you give them more stock than money. So that's a sell, right? It's all sales. It's all sales. Now you're an investor. If you can't raise money, how are you going to sell to a customer? If you can't convince an investor that you can sell a customer, how are you going to actually sell the customer? So you've got to think disciplined about investors as, okay, this is my first external sales. Consider your wife kind of an inside sale. So uh, they're going to um, be a target-rich environment. Even in Seattle, there's angels, there's super angels, there's wannabe angels, there's VCs, uh, there's VCs that act pretty regional, and there's VCs that try and invest more broadly, like an ignition. Um, don't waste your time on all that. Target them like you target anything else, like you target your market, right? Um, I know investor or uh, entrepreneurs that will get in front of anybody they, they hear has a checkbook, and um, do some due diligence on these guys. They might not be a good fit. So find the people that have invested in your space. If you're going to a partnership, it's important as to which partner you enter through. Find a partner that knows something about your space, made a lot of money in it, so they've had a positive experience, and would be willing, through their passion and their connection to your space, write a check and be confident in it. So I always do a lot of research on who I want to talk to at a firm. So due diligence is firm first, then partner, and find the right entry point. Um, and you can learn a lot about reading their bios, going to their background. Um, a lot of VCs like to talk. Panels, they're just always talking. They give you all their biases before you walk in the door. So I'm not saying change your pitch completely, but you do want to modify it and tailor it to their biases and understand it before you walk in the door. Um, who just failed? They're gonna, that's going to color it. Right now, the gaming industry is a little squishy because of Zynga's post-IPO. Frankly, they're nervous. It really doesn't have anything to do with the fact that companies like Supercell and, and uh, Rovio and Z2 Live are doing great businesses in that space. We get tainted because of the publicity of Zynga. So know that. Know those stories and have a supportable you know, response to, yeah, they're having trouble because of this, and this is how we're different and not going to be caught up in that. I have to do that right now about Z2 Live, given what you know the, the broad stroke brush that everybody paints with the, the Zynga post-IPO. Um, so again, which partner has the most enthusiasm? Um, this, this last, this, what message do they find? I mean, that's really cloud. There's, this guy's going, well, I'm investing in cloud. I don't even know what they're talking about. I, mean, I don't even know what that means. I mean, it's just, it's silly, but they, we have, you know, conferences on cloud. Uh, it's really nuts. Uh, but they're buying cloud. They were buying mobile four years ago. You go to a good business plan on a mobile game, they were buying it. Doesn't mean it was a good business plan, but they were buying it. So, you know, um, oftentimes it's good to orient how you're part of that overall cloud thing. Um, oh, this is. Uh, I'm trying to get this last point. I haven't seen it in two years. Uh, Delivered scale leverage. I, I think this is your, um, if somebody came to a venture capital right now with another mobile social app, they just like, it, it's, uh, uh, they get tired of, uh, the investments have been made, the, the plays have been out, and, and it's a tired space, and it's, lot, it's hard sometimes to get somebody, um, it, it's really like trend investing you're on a downtrend and you're fighting yourself. So you might have to message and position your company away from a trend that's on its downward. I think that's um, certainly true of mobile social. I think social TV was a big thing um, and it just got to be very, very, very old. All right, um, I threw this in. I don't know if it really belongs in here, but. Um, when you're describing your business, this could be more key. I think you guys are working on this, right? You said a one sentence thing? Okay, so if everybody feels 100% confident you've done a great job and you've knocked it out of the park, great. If you don't, this is for you, okay? This is a company that's been around quite a while. 
This is Yahoo. I'm sorry you can't read this. This is absolutely hilarious. This is actual text from Yahoo when Carol Farr took over and started creating the new Yahoo strategy. And this is their positioning statement, statement offered by their chief product officer, Blake Irvin. This actually happened, and there was quite a few press at this event. Um, Yahoo is a global series of web experience across a variety of devices that gives people what they want. In content, it connects advertisers. It doesn't matter. It just rambles on and on. You have no idea what this means. So they came back and they said, that's completely unacceptable. How in the world could you guys offer that as a positioning strategy? This is a major press release. This was covered with uh, cameras in real time. It was such a big deal because Yahoo was so visible at that time. So Carol jumped in. She's going to save Robert, right? So she jumps in. That's a true transcript. When Carol Barr said that, let, she jumps in and goes, listen, Yahoo's a great company that is very, very strong for content for she just starts rambling on. So positioning, clarity, focus is hard. It's not easy. It takes discipline. It takes discipline to come up with it, and it takes discipline to make sure you're always on message and you don't ramble. It's just like writing memos. If you had time, you'd make it shorter, right? So try and be crisp and clear about your position, and it will go a long way. The more you can shorten transmitting your company's core essence to somebody, and, you know, this is a fancy version of an elevator pitch advice, the better. This is a total fail, and it got her fired. <laughs> I mean, this thing just... And they followed this kind of clarity, and they went nowhere for quite some time. Anyway, all right. So, um, more of a pep talk thing here. Uh, I have all kinds of little platitudes. You know, eighty percent of success is showing up, and all those good things. But it, it really is about execution. Okay, the best. We've, you guys have all heard the story about the best technology never wins. I, I just had a conversation. Working at Medio is a predictive analytics company I founded in 2004. I went back there. I'm working there right now at Interim. And um, I had a sales rep tell me, well, we can't win on recommendations. We make recommendations. Uh, when you're hitting a website or on a phone um, and you're doing a search or buying something, we'll actually offer these targeted recommendations based on your behavior and your preferences and your likes and all that. And you, you hate to find out all the things we're tracking when you're tapping on your phone. But we do. And he says, well, we can't win on recommendations. Well, the truth is, we can. We absolutely can. They don't have to be better. That's not even the point. And I, I, maybe I'm jaded. I've learned this, but it almost has nothing to do with whether you're going to win or not. It's execution. It really is the details of generating qualified leads, moving on them, following up, clear messaging, clear value proposition. It's execution of the details. So if you're going in with the strongest technology, great. Now you have another bullet in your arrow in your quiver. But if you're not, execution wins every time. Uh, this goes to the talk about research and competitors. The only bad information is information you don't have because now you can't do anything about it. It might be hurting you, might be helping you, but you don't know either way. So you're not navigating against it or uh, with it. So um, don't sweat everything, but be aware and um, you know make sure bad news travels as fast as good news. Just do not get the happy ears concept where you just hear what you want to hear. You're living on just unbridled optimism. Um, the strength you need to develop is understanding there's bad news every day. That there's bad news every day too. It's okay. That's another challenge you're going to work through, and that's the kind of intestinal fortitude you got to build in your whole team. Is that we're going to take every challenge. There's going to be something tomorrow. We don't know what it is. And if there isn't tomorrow, great. But expect one the next day. Um, all this research, all this planning, kind of like the Heath Ledger Batman thing. You know, have a plan, but know it's going to possibly get blown up. Might be just a daily blow up, or might be a big blow up. So. Moral of the story, 2010, I was in here. I can't remember exactly when I gave this pitch, but sometime in 2010, Z2 Live pivoted. I don't remember if I was pitching that we were a platform or making games when I did this. I, I really can't remember, but just started to make games. 
Okay, yeah, so he remembers. So we were making a platform. We sold it to Activision. That's how we took their money. But we could see the business model just wasn't there. I could take money from Activision and EA and a couple of big gaming companies for quite a while and keep paying some engineers to build something and deliver it on time and get another deal and extend this over there, but we just weren't scaling. We cut it, and we had some help. Apple came out with an unexpected external threat that we could never identify and came out with a product called Game Center, which they've never, ever embraced gamers at all, the developers of that developer community. So they enforced you using Game Center. If you didn't use Game Center, they wouldn't promote you. They wouldn't market you. So it didn't matter. Our platform was better, by the way, and it was. It didn't matter. So we dropped it, and we pivoted, and we started making a game with the money we took from Activision. And we launched the game later that year, and it did very well. But that was a total, you know, I don't know, total, partial, whatever. We're still in the game space, but we went from making a platform to using that platform to launch our own games only and not license it to anybody. So it took us about six months to get off of the Activision, you know, umbilical cord and to produce the game at the same time. Uh, the par problem was the board, and um, so this is anecdotal, but games equal hits business, hits space business, it's like making movies, okay? Investors hate that. You're just saying, all right, every time we produce a product, we're going to put our marble on 37 black and spin the dial. That's awful. That's not a business plan. That's a trip to Snoqualmie Casino, right? So... Um, they hated it. So I guess the only salient quote was, okay, I guess we'll give you the rope to hang yourself. That's a true quote from a board meeting. Um, we had another quote that really irritated us. We had a budget for the, I'll tell you what the budget for the first game was. We had a budget for $65,000 to build trade nations, which is, by the way, made over $20 million at this point. And we've spent a lot more on it since then. But to get it to market was sixty-five grand, And we, I don't think we went over seventy-five grand. everything in on that game. And the quote at the thing was, because um, we were saying we're going to take the money we're getting from Activision, and we're going to build this game for $65,000, and we're going to launch it on Apple iTunes. That was the plan, okay? And we had people, by the way, that could build games. That wasn't the issue. We were just, you know, again, trying to find the right model, the right opportunity within this big, you know, uh, opportunity cloud of mobile and games and all that. Anyway, the quote was, how in the world will we ever make that $65,000 back? I mean, just saw it as a total bet, just a total flush the money down the toilet. They had so little confidence that you could build a game. Now, back then, not many games were making any real money. Apple was prating some early guys out there that made a few bucks, but it wasn't anything big in mid-2010. So um, the board was so convinced that this gaming thing was, okay, you could hit gold, but 99.9% .9 chance you're just pissing away money on a game in a Hail Mary, right? We were confident. We were pissed. I mean, I remember walking out of the board. We were steaming all the way up the street. Like, how could he not have confidence that we're going to kick it out of the park, right? And we did. So we went back to him with a little attitude, you know? And they said, luck. True story, <laughs> luck. So we had already started Metal Storm, and that's a game I shipped in a previous startup called Informa called Top Gun, back when the games really sucked. You had to press the number six to go right, and four to go left. It was just awful. A little black screen this big, and you couldn't even make out the planes. And still, we made a lot of money with this game. We licensed Paramount's Top Gun. You know, it still had the Tom Cruise, whatever, worldwide. It made a lot of money. So I was very confident that Metal Storm was going to be a big game. So. 48 hours, it's number one all over the world. Top grossing, category leader still on every iPad and every Apple store worldwide. I go into Beijing, kids are playing Metal Storm. Okay, I don't know how you did it, but you're lucky twice. <laughs> I mean, we had one board members like that was impressive, but we had still had a guy going, wow, I don't know. How you could be so lucky? And when we did our third game, they came in and said, okay, it's over. When we did Battle Nations and it went to number one top grossing, it was like, okay, we get it. And by the way, there's a story, but we weren't just lucky. Now you can measure everything. There's no excuse for ever shipping a game that doesn't make money because you can test everything. You can test the name on Facebook. You can test the icon on Facebook before you even pick it. 
Now you can put it up in Canada or Australia and test the bejeebies out of it with real life customers in markets. We've created all kinds of publishing names that you guys would never guess. We create false game title names and we ship the product and we test it and then we call it the real thing and call it Z2 Live and ship it worldwide. But we know exactly what it's going to do with ship it because we've tested it with real life, not focus groups, not surveys, actual gamers that play it and we measure the dollars. So we know before we're going to ship a game, it's going to make X amount of dollars every day. The only thing we can't control is how many people are going to uh, get it by virtue of promotions or advertising that we could not afford to do back then. So when Apple promotes it and features it, we get this free advertising and it goes nuts. And we also can't predict it'll become lunch boxes or shower curtains like Angry Birds did. Can you talk a little bit about the uh Well, the research we do on, on Facebook is you can uh, target your demographics specifically. So if we know the game appeals to 18 to 25-year-old males, I can do ads on Facebook for just that demographic. Okay? Then I can put up an icon, and it can say Metal Storm, Aces, and I have an icon. I put the same icon, the same verbiage, and I put Metal Storm, Air Combat, and I test those two names. We tested about eight different names, and we saw the take-up rate of each. So we picked the best name. I hate the name. It doesn't make sense to me. It's like you're mangling your plane in the sky or something. I, I'm not the buyer. It doesn't matter what I like. And that's what you got to learn. Trust your research. Do it well and trust it. And we trusted it, and it's, it's apparently a great performing name. I still don't get it. Trade Nations is a terrible name. We, did, we forgot to test it. That's why we learned to even test the icon of the name. We had this icon on Trade Nations that people thought looked like a pedophile. It was the mayor with this cheesy mustache, apparently, and this little mayor hat. He was the mayor of your village, but people had a name. We didn't test it. We thought it looked cute. We didn't even think, right? We test everything. We test everything. The verbiage, the icon, the name, the subname, the subtitle, we test everything. So then, like, they have a background in market research, so just throwing away, like, the, all the you know, focus groups and all that. So now you just basically go online and Well, no, the next thing we do is we actually put the game up on the iTunes store. They download it and they play it. And they give us great feedback as to what they like. We track every click, every movement in the game logic. We know where they get stuck. We know that level 3 is too hard. We know that level 7 is unfair. We know that you know, level 2 is too easy and we left money on the table. We track all that, but it's real data. It's not forecast. It's not predicted. It's actual measured against real users in the marketplace. So we'll launch a game up in you know, Canada called Nitro and uh, by a fictitious publishing company that we've got dozens of them. So that our competitors don't know what we're doing. And we'll get that data, and then we'll make those changes. And we'll test just the gameplay. Then we'll test the crafting or the sim building. Then we'll test the, the balance of the economy, how much virtual coins you get for every little thing. How does that keep you moving up? And we test all that before we actually put the final game together. So it's, it's, you know, it's not really market research. It's just a limited market. We're just doing 2% of the market to learn the lessons before we screw up with 98% of the market. So let's hold some other to wait.